Hi, this is Steve, and I want to welcome you to another Tech Leader Talk discussion. Uh, this interview today with Sebastian Esprella is part of the Space Tech Innovation Series, where I'm interviewing a variety of space tech leaders who share the latest trends and key insights that can be used to grow any tech company, not just space tech. This is a free event. You can register at spacetechinnovation.com and you get to see all the videos, the edited transcripts, and an executive summary for each interview. Today, as I mentioned, I'm talking with Sebastian Esprella. He's the CEO and co-founder of Think Orbital, and he has 25 years of leadership and entrepreneurship experience in multiple areas, such as business management, information technology, and aerospace. Think Orbital, is a space tech startup that's developing novel systems that autonomously assemble structures while orbiting the Earth. And the structures can be used for a variety of uh, different applications, such as servicing satellites while they're in orbit, managing space debris, in-space manufacturing, and space tourism. Uh, during this interview, Sebastian talks about the challenges that the Think Orbital team faces and the innovation that's necessary to develop and deploy these types of cutting edge systems that can perform in space. Um, I think you're gonna enjoy this discussion and you'll get some valuable insights about innovation and how to create completely new systems uh, that you can apply these ideas uh, in your own company today. So let's get to my discussion with Sebastian. Hey, Sebastian. Thanks for joining me today. It's a pleasure, Steve. Thanks for having me and, and, and Think Orbital. Yeah. I, uh, I gave a little background about you uh, and what you're doing, at least today, uh, in the intro. Tell us a little bit about it. I, I love hearing people's kind of story, and, and audience members have told me the same thing. What's your journey? What got you to the kind of the space industry work that you're doing today? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think like, like most people as a child looking, you know, looking up to the stars, looking at in my time was mostly, you know, the the, uh, the, the shuttle era and all the possibilities that lay ahead of us. Right. Um, yeah. uh, and um, and I, I love building stuff. So since, since I'm a child with a good friend of mine, you know, we had a workshop and, and just, you know, build, building sort of motorized things that look like vehicles. And, and that kind of got me started. Um I did electromechanics. Um, it was sort of half board type of electromechanics, cutting hardware, electronics, computing. But my mind was actually set on understanding how do you build a product. Um, so I did a foundation in psychology, and then I went into into business. And, and then you know, family happened, and, and then you have to put food on the table. And, yeah. and I'm mostly working on, on technology related activities, delivering over 18 products now. Um, stood up 25 teams. Over so about 500 million euros worth of expenditure, but my heart was set in deep tech space. In fact, the cross section between um, you know innovation, where you have um, you know technological feasibility, is there a market, and also can it be made profitable? And um, and what I did, I started you know supporting other startups, and the previous one was actually in renewable energy. But my mind was set on learning enough. Um, so at some point. I would find a brilliant team, a brilliant team of co-founders and a brilliant team overall, which I was very lucky to. Uh, during the COVID time, you know, it was kind of everybody was indoor, going online, into sort of obscure, deep tech uh, yeah. space for us. And that's where I met uh, Boita, Boita Hulub, um, who's the one that wrote, actually wrote the found, founding thesis uh, for the Corbital, the assembly process. Uh, it's been published in a, uh, AI AAA journal. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's more or less how I mean I'm kind of compressing quite a lot of things that happen in between, uh, but um, and that's why in a way it's, it's kind of my childhood dream come true, to be able to work uh, in, in space, uh, to be able to work in what I think it's it's the next frontier, um, you know where I think humanity uh, will be able to derive not just commercial value but also you know inspiration and and advance in consciousness as well. And I have to say I, I could have not dreamed to have as I said. A, better team of co-founders, a better team overall. And, and the family that I was mentioning just before we started recording are across the aerospace ecosystem um, in the US, in Europe, everywhere. Everyone's kind of helping each other, you know, raise the tide. So yeah, that's kind of international, my my story. Okay. So clearly you're excited about 
the space and the work that you're doing. But there's so many things. I was recently at a conference and heard people talk about, you know, their visions for the next 10, 20, some are going past 2050 even. And it's exciting. And there's just the, the technology and all the things that are that need to happen uh, to make those visions come true. What are you most excited about with all the stuff going on today in the space world? Well, I mean, first of all, launch. Um, you know, whereas in the past, we we had issues perhaps with, with enough cadence, with up mass, unfortunately mm -hmm. with reliability as well. I mean, that it's virtually solved um, thanks to the likes of, you know, SpaceX and, and, and Rocket Lab and, and Blue and, and quite a few others that are actually looking at different segments of the market. Uh, and, it, you know, with Starship coming online, it's a matter if, if of it's more about when, you know, we're, yeah. we're looking at, 100, 150, 200, 250 uh, tons of app mass. Um, and, and what do we do about that, right? And um, on all the possibilities that microgravity brings to be able to lift some of the heavy industry and yeah. even going beyond uh, when you talk about uh, mining. And, you know, there's a great startup called Astroforge with Jose Arcane that are looking at how can we mine um, rare earth metals uh, in space. Um, you know, that's, that's what really gets me excited. That will get me excited, you know, especially when you're pushing burning the candle at both ends. What are the possibilities that we can bring back to humanity with, with a vision of a future where, you know, we're living, playing and working in space, but also to look after our Earth. A bit like an Eden, you know, like a playground where, you know, all the things that unfortunately we've done to the environment, uh, including climate change, how can we, um, you know, avert that, um, give a place for humanity to thrive here on Earth, and at the same time, um, you know, leverage the opportunities that, that space brings. And, Putting all of that together, um, I think I think it's an exciting future. D despite you know some of the unfortunate things that we see here on Earth with the war in Ukraine, I think humanity is, is pointing towards a direction where, um, yeah, definitely space is, is the next frontier uh, for us to commercialize and, and to move into. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I agree. So tell us a little bit about kind of what some of the products are uh, that you envision for Think Orbital. Part of it's on the the screen background there behind you for, for anybody who's watching the video. Yeah, yeah. But, and there's a fantastic uh, simulation on your website that shows kind of how at least one of your, your products may work. Tell, just kind of tell us what you're thinking of, what's kind of the product plan for at least your, your first product. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Thank you. And I think it's a nice segue of why am I so excited about um, the future of humanity, but also the future of Think Orbital, because, you know, as much as, let's say SpaceX solved the, the, the bottleneck of launch, um, you know, we, we're coming on to the next bottleneck, which is, you know, in, infrastructure that is um, versatile enough and that is um, large enough to be able to cater for the needs of not just doing research, which we've done, um, you know, kind of historically in the International Space Station, but also to be able to serve the needs of, you know, manufacturing industries. So industries that would actually benefit from, been able to manufacture some of their assets in space, mm -hmm. uh, which now is prohibited because you know of cost, um, also schedules and timelines and, and, and what have you. So uh, what we're working towards is a product, and, and this is one of them. Oops, the other side. That's <laughs> what we call the Thin Platform Two. In fact, uh, we like to call that the uh, the, the, the Space Force Thin Platform Two because uh, we we've been uh, lucky to be awarded. Uh, to Space Force contracts for what's called an STTR Phase One, which which deliver, uh, successfully just delivered, and effectively that platform allows for servicing other assets, uh, also for refueling other assets, but also to be able to manufacture. And when we talk about manufacturing, we really talk about scaling industrial type of manufacturing. So providing, for example, with Starship on a, on a single launch configuration, we can provide four thousand cubic meters of space. That's that's just over wow. uh, four times the internal volume of the International Space Station. On a single launch, and and the reason why we're so excited about it is because we know unless you scale, you will not be able to reach position where um, industries will be able to manufacture it in yeah. space in a cost-effective manner. Um, so I think it's a mix between, yeah, make you know making something that adds value, um, you know that adds value not just to humanity as we mentioned earlier, but also adds adds value to our customers, and in a way. Um, that breaks that paradigm of, you know, what we call the tyranny of the fairing. We'd be building infrastructure uh, for space here on Earth for, I don't know if it's over four, four decades now, and it's always kind of limited to the fairing of the rocket, right? So, you know, you can only build a cylinder as big as you can actually fit it inside the rocket. That by 
Yeah. What we do is we stack the, the, the panels, the pressure vessels, um, in a way much very much like IKEA. I don't know if you, the audience knows what IKEA is, but very much like sort of flat pack furniture. And with a combination of, uh, of uh, robotic robotics and uh, an, an electronic welding gun, uh, we are able to assemble this infrastructure in space. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, again, super excited uh, with all the traction we had so far, which is over a year and a half old. Um, so, yeah. So what <clears throat> what kind of applications are you envisioning? You're kind of like, I guess, maybe the, the customers or the clients that would would use these uh, use use your structures is it just for like like repair and refueling or could they be habitable stations or things like that for humans yeah no absolutely so we see in one hand we see ourselves as a real estate developer in space <laughs> so we are providing the possibilities for those that want to operate yeah. um you know their, their capabilities in space and it could be well you know a manufacturing outfit uh, but also it could be servicing of assets um, you know, we've been approached also potentially of having uh, data centers in space. Uh, we know recently there was a study commissioned by the European Space Agency to Thales and a consortium to understand how you can lift not just one data center from Europe, but also all of the data centers. So to help also wow. with the carbon footprint. So we're working uh, with, with sort of a business model that allows the technology being developed from the ground up, uh, augment other free flying space stations with slightly smaller uh, sphere or what we call a thin platform one provide more storage, more space. We know there's a constraint on storage. There's an article coming out recently uh, regarding international space station constraints. But then moving on to the sort of large, large platforms. And we see uh, it's a nascent economy. Um, so, the, you know, the economy is developing in space. So there are just not enough data points um, to be able to understand what would necessarily be the killer app. But we have relatively strong signals when it comes to government needs, especially defense needs. Um, you know, servicing assets, extending the life of assets, even you know, dealing with uh, um, with debris in a way not necessarily to uh, to treat it as 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 junk. Uh, you know, something to deorbit, but very much it's something that you could probably use it as a resource. Um, hmm. You know, propellant fuel and, and what have you. Um, and, and yeah, these are the things um, I wish I could share a little bit more. But um, yeah, we were we were quite successful on a recent study that we did on how we can actually treat. Um, Debris in space, in collaboration with again another outstanding startup called KMI, Cal Morris, uh, who have very much a focus on uh, on the you know, debris remediation. Okay, it's interesting. So a, lot, a lot more coming on, on this, hopefully in, in the near future. Okay, well, I will certainly be keeping watch for those announcements that are public. So, how do you kind of fit into this growing ecosystem? Are you Going to be partnering up with other organizations, other systems. What just what do you kind of envision on how Think Orbital's products fit into the overall system? Yeah. So I mean, since the outset, um, we you know we, we realized that we don't believe in competition. I think um, there is a need to find a niche, a need, a need to find a product that adds value, um, and in that value to what other people may see as competitors. So we have a great relationship. You know, with, with quite a lot of other players that are developing space stations for for NASA and you know from Action Space to all this you know the CLD partners including Blue Origin and Sierra, and we cheer them on. And, and what we try to do is to try and see you know how can we support them? Is there a way for us to be able to augment uh, their their product offering? And that's part of the ecosystem, right? Um, and then that would be for what we call, as I mentioned earlier, our theme platform one. If it's sort of an augmentation of another free flyer space station. Uh, but at the same time, we're looking at, um, you know, who out there, um, and, you know, we have a brief conversation, for example, with the guys from BMW um, and, and a few other entities as well. So who out there who operates on, on terrestrial markets may benefit from maybe not, you know, fully manufacturing product in space, but maybe manufacturing part, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, and, and, and a, few, a few other applications. But anyway, kind of long story short, what we're trying to do is build uh, that ecosystem. Uh, build that family, build that relationship across um, more established organizations to you know newer startups. Because at the end of the day, what we offer is a platform. You know, as a platform, you normally end up with sort of double-ended networks where you support an entity to be able to do their activity, their core business model, and connect them potentially with a with a customer at the other end. And as a platform, um, you know, we we. We need to be conscious also most of the calls we have, we have about 200 discovery calls so far. You know, it's great. Every person that we talk to, they come up with a different use case. 
Um, and, and that in itself is great, but on the other hand, it's a bit of a uh, risk as well because you can end up with a lot of use cases. So we're, what we're doing now, uh, we, we just finalized a commercialization strategy uh, where we, we looked at, you know, talking, we basically talked to prospective customers. We narrowed down their needs uh, mm -hmm. to be able to, um, you know, score what of all of the possible applications that we could support within our platform would be the ones that are in one hand higher, have the higher chances of commercialization, but also have the chances of being commercialized early. Yeah. So, okay. It, it's interesting that you talk about people and potential customers get the feedback because that's a, a theme I've heard with a lot of people that I've interviewed for the podcast and talked with just in business that. That's if, if you don't do that, that seems to be one of the main failures for companies, you know, running off and building something that there really isn't a need for. How this is what I see, um, unfortunately, and, and, and that's why we want to build that ecosystem. I see it also with not many, but other startups where obviously, I mean, I love hardware, I love, you know, I love tech. Um, so sometimes we run a risk of being too focused on what we think we should do. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think we're told like any other company, uh, you know, we're, we're just background U.S. Delaware C Corp. Um, but any other company, we have to be a going concern. We have to become profitable. We don't want to be heavily relying on investors, certainly not in the longer term. And the yeah. only way you can do that is if you identify customers, if you identify yeah. their needs, their pain points. And I'm telling you all the things that you know, but maybe there is someone out there that listens and maybe take, you know, take, takes um, takes some value out of this. The only reason why we exist is because there are and there will be customers. And there will be customers that will benefit from our products, nothing else. Yep. And that, that's why it's also our objective number one. We have a list of objectives. And objective number one is to be able to um, you know, identify and, and support the customer and, and, and then go through the process until you sign an agreement. Right. Great. That's a great approach. So as you're going out and talking to these hundred or so people, especially initially when maybe they didn't know much about what you're doing. Did you get any pushback or feedback? That's just like, this is crazy. You can't do this. And because you're in a pretty new area, what did you, did you get feedback like that? And if so, how did you, how did that uh, impact you? Oh yeah. I mean, we, we had, I mean, I lost count after 150 calls, but we certainly must have had over 100 calls by now. Okay. And uh, it's funny you say that because, you know, I have I have normally two ending questions to, you know, whenever we have a call. So one of them is, you know, how do you think we're going to fail? Uh, and the second one is, would you like to come to space with us? And, and normally the answer is yes, at least from our close community. But um, I've, um, I really want to know why people would think that we may fail. I mean, that's best. Um, you know, the best type of advice you can get, right? And uh, and the, the challenge has been, um, you know, other than, of course, you know, market conditions and, you know, perhaps some potential funding constraints, we have not had anyone telling us it's technologically not feasible. And and we okay. spoke to, you know, people who've been in the industry for 40 years, people who build stuff, you know, that is always from orbit all the way to Mars. And... Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's encouraging. And that, that's one of the things we were looking for. Why do you think we're going to fail? Mm -hmm. And um, and I still remember, you know, someone I consider a great friend and also a mentor, Daniel Faber from Orbit Fab. Uh, our first call, he told us 21 reasons why we're going to fail. And, and it was great. And I, I think, I don't know if I asked him afterwards or not, but I think he was a little bit perplexed because I was smiling. I love to know. I mean, I don't see fail as a negative thing. Is that fail is, is an opportunity to learn, right? I know it sounds a bit yeah. cliche, um, but and I, and this is a constant feedback that I have with the team. So, what what are the risks that we're facing? What are the mitigating yeah. controls? How are we likely to fail? And and every new team member that we have coming on board, we like that fresh uh, outside in view of telling us why why we're likely to fail. So, okay. yeah, hopefully I answer your question. So so is that I mean. A lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of business people, if they got something, a list of 21 different ways that you're going to fail, um, any one of which could could kill the company, um, it would be depressing, that might be upsetting, and yet you're smiling. So what, what was the feeling you got when you heard that list of 21? And then what was the reaction? Oh, it was great. Yeah, I was just, I was taking notes. Also, Dan has a lot of experience. Um, so just to be able to access that wealth of knowledge, because first it was the I think it was 21, but let's say it was a number of reasons why we were going to fail. Then following that, uh, it was about how can we overcome? What yeah. can we do about it? Not 
for any of those reasons, not 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 you know not to basically um, trump the uh, the progress that we we eventually. I mean, we're over a year and a half old, and we had so much traction. So I would say down to these kind of conversations that we had, that we managed to preempt, do our homework, you know, uh, and prepare for you know for the potential of of any of these options to actually uh, materialize. Yep. I mean, ultimately, I think um, you know there. I'm not sure if you know generally people don't want to fail. I mean, I don't think we should, one should pursue failure. If you see what I mean. Um, and I, I was talking to a friend of mine. In, in a way, how my mind works is that I have a strong belief that we will succeed, but at the same time, I'm conscious of the fact that we can fail. Okay. But I mean, but the failure doesn't necessarily determine. It's a it's a it's a tool to be able to anticipate to do my homework, and then there are things that. You, that you can do that are under your control and things that are not under your control. And failure, if it happens, is also an opportunity for you to learn and to overcome that failure. I mean, I'll, I'll give you perhaps a brief example um, yeah. where maybe my mind comes from. So I was I was born in Argentina, and for those people that know, you know, there's always been a crisis of, of some sort, right? And um, and I come from a working class background, and we had a period of time where just you know, my my dad he lost his job. We have no food on the table, and there was the opportunity of being able to look at okay, well, what what do we do in these circumstances, right? And uh, and that kind of pushed me, uh, you know, to think about and that's a silly example, perhaps, but that's the first entrepreneurship experience I had. We had a lemon tree at the back. I took out the lemons. I started making lemonade, and it was pocket money. Of course, I didn't save, uh, you know, enough to be able to support my family. But you know, that that potential hardship, that potential failure, that impacted my family, kind of enabled me to think about what are the opportunities out there, and that. The, lem- the lemonade, I sold it in exchange of, you know, newspapers that then I took to the mill factory, which was not far off, that would give me some cash. And there was the cookie factory next door and I would buy secondhand cookies. You know what I mean? And, and, and that mindset, I think I carried on throughout life where if there is a potential hardship or failure, how can you turn that into an opportunity? How can you turn that into a lesson? And in a way, if you think about it, it kind of gives you a competitive advantage from people who Fortunately, you have not had to go through these hardships because the time that they may be hit with hardship or failure, they may look at it as, you know, as something that is rather negative, that there is no outcome, there is no possibilities, et cetera, et cetera. Hopefully yeah. it makes sense. May I have been a bit yeah. of a... No, 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 it does. And yeah, I love that question. I hadn't heard it phrased quite that, that how, yeah, asking when you're getting the business going, what ways do you think we can fail? So yeah. be thinking about those and have a plan because whatever list you get, there's probably always going to be one or two other things out there that you haven't thought about. So if you can, I guess, have a plan or have at least thought of, of all those different options and how, how you'd uh, deal with them if, if they come up, that, that's, that's fantastic yeah. advice. I have to say, I also get a little kick out of when I see people's faces, when I ask the question, because they're like, well, are you asking me why? No, of course you're not going to fail. I said, well, I will do our best not to fail. But from your perspective, what are the reasons that you think we're going to fail? I don't know, I want you to be successful. No, but please tell us. I mean, and then when people are forthcoming, there are things that, yeah, like you said, there are a few things that we may not have thought about. Uh, so, yeah, it's quite interesting. <laughs> Fun. So you're building things that are going to operate in, in space, in a, a hostile environment, a difficult environment. Mm-hmm. What, and you can't, you don't have test labs up in space. What are you doing on Earth then as you, uh, develop these products what kind of testing and simulation can you do on earth and I, I was recently at a conference they talked about a lot of the the software based uh tools that are helping with design and development what just generally what what kind of things are you doing to to simulate these products before they go into orbit yeah i know absolutely so um there, there is so much simulation you can do uh on software and i do have a background on on software more than hardware in the last two decades, although I started with hardware first. Mm-hmm. So I, um, you know, one of our principles is to leverage as much as we can on simulating, uh, you know, the environment, uh, utilizing yeah. software tools in a way because the simulation process normally it's it's a lot faster than if and it's a lot cheaper than than if you were trying to do it with with atoms as opposed to bytes. Um, but there's so much that simulation can do, right? And, and then you start moving in terms of iteration of the product uh, or the prototype. Uh, and, you know, you, really, if you, if you think about it, um, most of what you cannot simulate here on Earth, although there are ways to do it, it's, you know, the microgravity environment. Because, you know, you have thermal vacuum chambers, um, so you can, you know, you can 
operate under vacuum conditions. You can operate up under variations, of thermal variations. Um, and even there's some test beds that you can do with regards to gravity as well. So, so in a way, there's a, there's a lot you can do. But even though you can do a lot, I, I think um, fair to say that you know space heritage carries a lot of weight. Um, so the idea that um, that you can do everything here on Earth and you know bring enough certainty and go directly to product in space, I, I think it's unfathomable. Uh, it's it's not reasonable. So anyway, what what we're doing is simulation where possible. Then uh, you know software simulation where possible, mm -hmm. and, and we use the likes of GMAT and, and, and a few other tools as well. Um, and then you know hardware simulation under um, you know vacuum chamber thermal vacuum chamber conditions, and then to do um, you know some some demos in, in space. And we're we're planning to do a demo. You know, unfortunately, I cannot share a lot of the details yet. Hopefully, in, in a few weeks. Uh, but we're planning basically to do demos that demonstrate. Uh, that you know that not only we can weld, but we can assemble and we can pressurize uh, in space. Okay. And um, maybe just to wrap up the answer, we have some great engineering minds in the team. Um, you know, working at big corporations like Boeing, all the way to uh, the few people that work at SpaceX. Um, so we we feel we feel quite confident that we are the team that that can deliver on the technology roadmap that we have. Okay, that's great. So. Kind of along those lines, and yeah, don't don't give away anything proprietary, but you're creating something brand new. Uh, this isn't just an iteration of an existing product. Not not to downplay those iterations, but this is a bigger job to create something new. Because you're you're innovating, you're inventing new things to create this system. What's your just in general kind of what's your approach to creating something like this, this where you don't have a previous version to build upon or things like that? How are you how are you approaching this? Really big task. Yeah, I think that's a great question. So the first thing is we're not bending physics, so we, we don't need to create a new a new law. Right. So that's the main thing. It's it's really an uh, if you look at it from a technology perspective, it's really a bunch of engineering challenges. And okay. what we try to do is, um, and I mentioned that very briefly. So what's key, I believe, in any product is to hit that sweet spot of innovation where is it technologically feasible. You know, will you be able to commercialize? So is there a market that the customers and can you make it profitable? Um, uh, and, and then from the perspective of the technology itself, what we try to do, we basically, very briefly, so we listed all the subsystems. It's basically the technology stack of what you need for the product to be operational. And then we identify, so what of those subsystems, uh, what level of technology readiness level do they have? Normally one is low, nine is, you know, fully 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 operational. And what of those subsystems are actually op offered in the market, you know, as a, as an off the shelf solution, almost right, okay. like a robotic arm, etc. So what you do in a way, you're you're breaking down this big engineering challenge into different components. You still have to think about it from a system perspective, right? All of it needs to be operating in unison, but you break it down in a way that you understand. Okay, robotic arms are relatively mature. Who are the more mature players in the market? Who could provide these capabilities? Okay, does it make sense for us to do our R and D for robotic arms? Most likely not. So, uh, and then you go through all the subsystems and then you identify which of those would be core for you, which of those would make sense for you to actually do the art and research and development and own the IP. And for which of those you have a higher risk of, uh, of technological challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, once once you have derived that, then you have to start going into what we said a, a little bit earlier on the, on the answer, you know, simulating how would this operate? You know, how would it be operating in space? Also because of, you know, the thermal variations you have in space. If you're welding, you know, um, and 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 so on and so forth. Um, but again, we're you know, I'm a strong believer that we're standing in the shoulders of giants. We we were talking, isn't it, Steve, about you know the the, the heroes of, of the Apollo era and then the shuttle, and and many many others, you know, from from all walks of life that have actually allowed us to be where we are now. So, yeah. uh, with that in mind, um, you know, some of the technologies have been proven in space. Um, some of the technology is not, but it's true that what we are building together as one product, that is the piece of innovation that has not happened yet. Okay. That's interesting. What's so You mentioned earlier <clears throat> kind of what you're excited about in space in general, but as far as your current position and the work that you're doing today with Think Orbital, what do you love the most? Um, I think, I mean, the, the team, I cannot... Um, I cannot say it enough. We have an amazing team. I learned from 
every single one of them every day. Um, and you know, the beauty of, of um, a startup, although you know it is challenging at times, um, you know, with regards to time, the effort, the uncertainty. Um, but one of the things that you can build a culture uh, from the ground up, and yeah. having that that culture that you know is the culture that you want to work in, where you know we're we're very open about things, uh, we support each other, we challenge each other, um, you know, we 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 take each other to the max in a way. I mean, what I tend to look in, in our team members is that well, that they're they're smart, um, that you know they they believe in the mission. Um, that you know, obviously, they, that they work hard, but also people that you're willing to hang out with them a lot, because you're going to be hanging out with them a lot. So certainly, yeah. the, the team, um, alongside the team, is the mission. I strongly believe that what I mentioned earlier um, to allow for Earth to be able to recover a little bit, we need to be able to start lifting some of the heavy industry into space. Um, you know, allowing for some of the space technology to support. Uh, the issues that we are encountering now with climate change, uh, and that's the second pillar. And the third pillar is, I, I, I believe, also from the experience of those who have been to space, and we're lucky enough that we have one of our advisors who's been to space six times, that there is a shift in consciousness. So people that normally go to space and experience, you know, the darkness of space and, and looking up back onto Earth, um, there's that shift in consciousness where you cannot see the borders between countries, and you realize that everything that happened to humanity. It happened in this sort of, uh, you know, little little blue ball uh, floating around in the middle of nowhere. And I think it gives you that sense of unity um, that, that we have, I think, as humanity, but we need we need to basically cultivate more and more. So, yeah, these are the... the and, and when I talk about the team, uh, obviously I have a core team, which works in Corbital, but I do tend to think about the team when it comes to all the other partners that we work with, the startups, the companies, our customers. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a real pleasure, Steve. Yeah. I'm humbled. Okay. <laughs> I can tell by the way you explain it that, that you're passionate about it. Yeah. What, not necessarily for Think Orbital, but kind of the space industry in general, what's the biggest challenge you think that, it, that they're facing right now in that industry or in that ecosystem? Yeah, I think right now... Um, for startups, perhaps it's the sort of the, the, the market conditions, um, especially when it comes to funding. I think that's that's a real challenge in one hand, although um, I think it's healthy, and and I can go into a bit more detail if you're interested why I think it's healthy. Um, but but it's also cha- changing that that mindset. Um, I, I think there is a there is a, a paradigm shift that we need. We have a legacy mindset of scarcity, you know, scarcity of launch scarcity of infrastructure in space. So we, we tend to make things very small, very light, very expensive. We um, maybe over-engineer it. It's kind of a negative connotation, but we, we kind of engineer fail-safes over fail-safe over fail-safe because, you know, you have to make it in this one launch and you can only do it once and all the rest. So, uh, and you know, I was invited. Um, again, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be invited by brilliant people like, like yourself, Steve, and I was invited also to a number of events. To, to the, one of them was a keynote speak in Luxembourg a few months ago. And, and I remember seeing, um, you know, one of the uh, talks during the event where, you know, there was a big manufacturing company and, and, and other companies talking about how, how could we do this with the constraints in mind, et cetera, looking out into 10 to 20 years. And uh, and I took the, the microphone and, I, I you know, I tried very politely to challenge that because the trouble is if we keep thinking about it in terms of small terms and light terms, we will never reach a position where we can really leverage on space, um, you know, to, to industrialize space, to commercialize space, to lift this heavy industry. So unless we break that, um, I'm kind of repeating myself a little bit now, but unless we break that paradigm and we realize that, look, guys, launch is sold. We will be able to put a lot of things in place. And a, a space in space will also be sold. Because of Think Orbital, and because I'm sure a lot of other, you know, friends will actually be able to help uh, help solve it. And unless we can do that, um, you know, we maybe end up in a situation where there will be yet another gap of 20, 30, 40, 50 years, um, uh, like we've seen in the past, where you see, you know, it seems like promising this technology, and then nothing happens. Yeah. Uh, unless we do that, then unfortunately we maybe end up in that situation. And then, you know, other uh, competing nations are very much fast forwarding like you know like you see for example china um their commercialization space so it's an opportunity it's an opportunity that i see it's always 
kind of there that that we want to try and support the the US and the others. Okay. Anyway, I'm kind of going on attention, but you, you get <laughs> yes, yeah, I do. So you mentioned a little bit earlier in that answer that that especially for startups who maybe need some funding, it's you know, developing space technology is not a an inexpensive thing to do. How might this current environment where the it, the funds aren't as available or they're, they're more difficult to get, how could that actually help them maybe in the long run, in your opinion? I think it will, it will help the industry overall. Okay. Um, and, and why do I say this is because uh, we, we went through a number of years where, you know, money was cheap and um, there, there were investors competing to try and get onto the term sheet of a particular startup that may, may only have had a PowerPoint presentation. You know, may, may have been, you know, and again, I'm not putting them down. That's, that, and that's great, right? I think we need, in fact, we need more entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, but the challenge with that is when money comes easily, um, and it's a reverse of what I was telling about my hardship as I was growing up, then you lose a little bit that, that you know, that hunger, I think, or, um, uh, you know, they say necessity is the mother of all innovation, right? So mm -hmm. and then you become a little bit less efficient and um, okay. and then you end up in a situation where you know good capital is being deployed and something that doesn't have a product market fit or or perhaps you know it's been uh, pursued in a way that is very inefficient right um so what that happens it, it's in the situation that we're now right so the use of capital has been in a way that has not derived enough value we realize that model of growth at all costs it just it just to me it, it doesn't work it's very wasteful um, so in the situation that we are now, where um, you know, unfortunately for 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 those startups that may have to have a hard awakening, um, you know, those that may may fall, may go bankrupt, or may be having to merge or acquire, um, there will be consolidation um, that will take place. Uh, but I strongly believe whoever is standing at the end would be those companies that do have a product that adds value, a product that, that has a market feed, that is operating in a way that is ethical, that is conscious in terms of how they're deploying dollars, especially when it comes to taxpayers' dollars. Um, so I think overall for the industry, overall for the customers, and even overall for the investors, I think it's a better place to be in. And, and you know, sometimes um, uh, perhaps you know some, some of my fellow entrepreneurs may not understand the difficulties the investors have. The investors have to, they, they themselves, they need to go and raise capital, right? And when they deploy capital, right. they, also are, uh, they also have to respond to their anchor, to their LPs. So they are taking a lot of risks themselves, perhaps they're using their own capital, they're taking a lot of reputational risks. And the fact that now there is a much deeper and stronger due diligence to go through, it means that the funds will inevitably, I mean, there, and there is risk, of course, and that's why venture capital is called venture capital. But the due diligence will yeah. allow for those dollars to be deployed where um, there are hi higher chances of success, and mm -hmm. I think, and I think the beauty, just to close it off, um, of um, of perhaps the the segment that we are operating at least in Corbital, is that we're operating in deep tech, um, predominantly hardware. We're about, I would say, if I was to give a number, sixty to seventy percent hardware. Then there is a software and some machine learning and a potential you know, um, broad, um, narrow AI. Um, that uh, historically those type of investments have a longer outlook. And by having a longer outlook uh, or horizon in terms of when you're expecting to have a return, it means you're going to get over. I mean, we're likely to go into a recession this year. Maybe next year is going to be hard. But, you know, inevitably the market is going to pick up again. So if you do an investment in that technology, like, for example, think Orbital today, it means that you, when you start reaping the rewards, you're already at, at the other end uh, in, a, in a much, much better market condition. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. What <clears throat> so we're running towards the end of our our time today. What's ahead for you and the team at Think Orbital for at least for the rest of this year and looking forward into next year? Well, we, we're very strong. We we just um, delivered on on our, our two first contracts, uh, which we're super excited right. for. Uh, both of them supporting the Department of Defense, uh, specifically the U.S. Space Force, and we delivered them successfully. So we we got them signed off. Um, so that's that's a big tick. Um, and basically, to continue to work on on both developing the business, um, keep recruiting what we call the top one percent. Um, and again, we cannot emphasize enough how great the team is. To keep developing our technology, uh, we've already um, engaged with. Um, uh, er, er, the research institute that is um, helping us develop one of our core technologies, the electronic welding technology. 
uh, and we're looking towards having a, a demo uh, both here on Earth and space within the next 12 to 14 months. Again, I'd love to be able to share some of the details in that sense. Uh, but if I was to summarize is keep developing um, you know, the, the team, the company itself, keep looking for that commercialization, that product market feed, uh, eventually you know, keep signing deals with customers, both government and, and private, and then develop the technology as well in a way to prove that, you know, that we're a team that can do hardware, but also to de-risk the overall uh, product um, delivery as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's going to be exciting. I I will be watching. I'll be excited to see see the new developments and and the new technology as you release it and make it uh, publicly available. So please come visit us in Colorado whenever you're around Colorado. I will. I will be in Colorado Springs uh, within the next few months, and I'll yeah certainly Perfect. see if we can arrange a visit. What uh, I'm sure the listeners will want to learn more. Uh, maybe even have some questions. What's the best way for them to reach out? Uh, to you or to the, the team at Think Orbital uh, with any questions or to get some more information? Yeah, I mean, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, uh, you, you can find me, Sebastian Asprella. Um, I, I'll do my best. I, I do get, you know, fortunately, I'm, I'm very grateful. I get loads of messages every day and loads of connections. I'm sure I cannot reply to all of them, certainly not, not as much as I would like. But please reach out, follow us, support us on LinkedIn. I mean, all the support that we had so far it's been wonderful. Um, also, we have a few emails on our website if you're interested to work for, for, for Think Orbital um, and also if, you, if you're interested in our product. Um, but yeah, by all means, you know, reach out. Um, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to have a chat and, and build this uh, wonderful community together. Okay. And I'll certainly put links in the show notes to, to your LinkedIn profile, uh, to the company's website, and a link to that fantastic uh, video that shows the simulation of your, your system. because. Uh, it impressed me. So I was excited about it. So uh, I know you're busy. I thank you for your time today and sharing you know, your thoughts on the space industry as a whole and, and all the exciting things going on at Think Orbital. And I uh, just want to thank you for your time. And I, I wish you and the company the best. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you also to, to your audience, to your listeners. Uh, and I look forward to maybe getting to know uh, a few of them in the future. Thank you so okay. much. That's great. Thanks. <laughs>